Opportunity Calls with Ellen Volpe is sponsored by LongIsland.com. Thanks for joining me today, Hilder. I'd like to start with your last name. Perhaps you could tell us about the origin of your name. Well, thanks for having me. My last name is uh, Paulsdóttir, and it means the daughter of Paul. So my ancestors are uh, from, I, I'm from Iceland, several generations back to the year 874. Wow. And I am the, I'm the daughter of Paul. <laughs> so the last name is Paul's daughter, uh, means that I am the daughter of Paul, my father. And uh, if you've read any of the Icelandic sagas, that's how they begin, by identifying the fathers. Well, I've, uh, I found that fascinating uh, when, when you shared that with me. And um, I just think that so many of us don't have that much contact with the culture of Iceland. And it's really fascinating to meet you and to learn all about it. Um, as I mentioned, I think that you're one of the most interesting people I've met really in my 33 years of business. You have so many different facets that it's hard to begin uh, you know, where to begin uh, speaking to you. But I know that you left Iceland when you were 19. Um, you traveled to several countries uh, getting your education and ended up in uh, California and Berkeley. Um, and you were studying something called bioenergetics. Is that correct? Do I have that correct? Yes, my work uh, often centered uh, on, in the field of cellular bioenergetics. So I, but I was studying molecular structures and um, I really enjoyed studying molecular structures in context. And therefore in Berkeley, we were working with a high pressure freezing technique where we would apply great pressure so that the uh, crystals wouldn't uh, destroy the biological structures. And then we would look at molecular motors and machines in context, in the cellular context, and then study um, the workings of the cell and especially what happens in cancer, uh, deregulation, the structural differences between tissues. How do you think um, that um, affects our world today, especially during COVID? What is, what is the relationship to what you studied, um, to what we're experiencing today? Well, uh, it, it touches upon something that I care about uh, in terms of uh, preservation and conservation. Since, since the time I worked in the lab in Berkeley, I have stepped out of the lab and into the world, so to speak, and I do spend considerable, considerable effort on uh, conservation, preservation of uh, the lands we're living on. And, and that's significant because I think the way we live and the extractive mentality, the way we have upset the natural balance, it, we're living the results of that today. You could say that the climate crisis, and I, I am one to believe that um, COVID is a result of disturbing the habitat of, of wild animals that um, then we experience the cross of the spillover mm -hmm. of the virus from uh, whether it was um, bats or in the beginning it was thought to be pangolins, but the COVID crisis brought our attention to the crisis that we're in, in not caring enough for other animals. And um, I, I have decided to devote the rest of my life on, on in the more than macromolecular world, I'm out uh, and about uh, educating. I'm an environmental educator and I, uh, I, I welcome the attention that we now have mm -hmm. on the illegal trafficking of pangolins, the inhumane handling of animals uh, as became news from the web markets. And the way we live is simply not in balance. And therefore brings me to my passion project in terms of restorative or regenerative view to restore or repair where we can. Mm -hmm. Yes. So would you say that um, uh, all those years ago, studying that aspect of science gave you sort of a very, very um, you know, particular view 
of uh, how things are connected and, um, and what the potential is for uh, things like this to happen. Yes, on, a, on a, both a micro and macro scale, we're all connected and we're connected to the living world that we're in. And uh, that realization has to be met uh, sooner than later. We're really uh, embedded in climate change right now and it depends on how we respond to that mm -hmm. that will um, predict the viability of our species amongst the others we're actually in the midst of uh, the sixth extinction uh, mass extinction hmm. and uh, it's up to us whether we'd like to join that wave or or stay and care for each other and and that actually was that realization uh, in terms of awareness of cause and effect the way we treat the living world really directly affects our own well-being. That was what um, encouraged me to step out of the lab and into the world at that time. I was working at NYU Medical School at the time as a research scientist, and there was a chemical spill mm. for aldehyde. while at the same time I was pregnant with my firstborn. Oh, boy. And um, that helped me make this decision that if, if not now, then when? Mm. Mm -hmm. And that we have, um, I'm one of the uh, environmental educators who believe that we have about 10 years to write what's wrong mm -hmm. and we must act now. And at the time I became a tree sister, tree sisters are reforesting the tropics and do that in an ethically and, and humane way, empowering the communities where we reforest. And in the beginning in 2016, that movement, we had the humble goal of a million trees. Hmm. It was a million trees campaign. There was just a couple of us who donated monthly to reforestation in that effort. And uh, we are now celebrating 15 million trees and growing wow. with over 4,000 uh, donors monthly and uh, 200,000 likes on Facebook, if that matters. Actually, Facebook turned into the platform that grew that organization. So I had this uh, sense of ur urgency where I felt I couldn't really dedicate the next 10 years to looking at the microscope and the, and the cellular structures anymore. I, I really wanted to make more difference in the, in the world at large. And I believe uh, my care for life was uh, naturally ignited by carrying my son and then being in the middle of that chemical spill mm -hmm. sent me out of the lab because I figured I wasn't doing what was best by him. Mm. Something else I just learned about you. Um, that must have brought you uh, to the organization that I don't think many people know about, the Rewild Long Island organization. And I'm yes. wondering if you could tell us about the mission um, and the movement, um, because I'm sure most people are completely unaware that it even exists. Yes, Rewild Long Island um, was really born out of discomfort. I had just moved to suburban settings and I was really uncomfortable as a, a grassroots activist, mm. uh, uncomfortable uh, with the chemical lawn and our practices that were, are not climate friendly, mm. uh, from gas blowers and gas powered lawn mowers to um, the fertilizers and pesticides. And I, I'm sure you remember, I remember driving cross country and the windshield effect mm -hmm. where we would have just um, uh, insects, you'd have to stop and actually wipe them off the, of the screen, but that's not the case anymore. Mm -hmm. we, we, you know, we don't have as many insects and why that, uh, it, most people think, you know, that how wonderful, you know, not too many insects to bite me, but, but if, um, if we know E.O. Wilson's work, he was a naturalist who, um, he believed the little things run the world and I believe so too. We need the insects to turn over the soil. With Rewild Long Island, we're planting native plants. Native plants are deep rooted and designed for the soil we're standing on. So they need no chemical assistance. After we've established a native plant garden, there's not, uh, no need for fertilizer and uh, certainly less need for watering. 
Mm -hmm. and feed the local insect population where we are. And if we understand how everything is connected, then uh, that becomes of importance. And the Rewild Long Island is a movement now. It's a, a legal nonprofit. I was there from the beginning, inspired by Tree Sisters, seeing how we can make a difference. Nice. Oh, we can actually, if we believe we can, we, we will. And we uh, were created, it was a group of us who were meeting regularly at the library. It was a real, uh, uh, it was a cluster of like um, 10 to 20 people who'd meet monthly. And we then gathered around the course. And now there's hundreds of us and growing. And uh, Rewild Long Island hosts native plant sales. Hmm. And, and this can only benefit the ground we're standing on. What, mo what, what most people don't know is that every year we're losing billion tons of topsoil per person hmm. on earth. And that's erosion. Uh, and if we don't bind the soil, we're basically going to lose the land we're standing on. With Rewild Long Island, it's one of the few things humans can do when you are actually helping and leaving the ground in better shape than when you found it. Because many of the ways we live are extractive, are taking away and causing damage. But when we plant the native plant, they are deep rooted compared to um, the non-natives. They need less watering. Uh, there is no need for chemical assistance. So we're binding the soil and most importantly, feeding the insect population and that in turn will feed the bird population. And we're part of a healthy cycle of life. What uh, became clear just recently is we've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. Wow. Um, there was a count uh, that we've lost one out of four birds uh, since the 1970s when Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring. These are chilling facts and we're in the midst of this biodiversity crisis. And if the connection isn't made sooner, we will pay a devastating price. There is a, the climate crisis is basically the result of a million bad choices. Hmm. And it's uh, symptomatic of that cause and effect that then leaves us with a situation that's out of control. But the good news is we can make a difference. Mm -hmm. So there is a new movement, a regenerative movement. It's beyond sustainability, regeneration, to restore, to replenish, is to um, rejuvenate. And uh, I follow that movement. There's a wonderful uh, documentary actually on Netflix now called Kiss the Ground hmm. that follows this concept that I, I would like to recommend to the viewers but with regeneration we're going beyond sustainability because we can't sustain a sick culture we must um, we must do better than that now thanks Hilda that was amazing information I'm sure that will be interesting to everybody I'm Ellen Balthy and we'll be right back after this short break Opportunity Calls with Ellen Volpe is presented by ABA American Business Associates. To learn more about ABA, visit aba-ny.com. So dedicated to youth and environmental education, you're also the president of the Board of Trustees at the Science Museum of Long Island. Can you please tell us about the programs that are being offered and especially now the ones that are being held virtually um, and um, why you started, um, why you got involved in that organization? Yes, I, I'm, I'm deeply inspired by um, the setting we're in and I'm actually here right now at the Science Museum of Long Island. I, our website is smli.org and uh, we are dedicated to educating both youth and children about science, sustainable science, how uh, and why we should be doing science. And we're blessed with natural settings and there is considerable um, conservation and preservation effort here, removal of invasives and um, maintenance of healthy grounds that I really care about. So I joined as, um, 
I was a member of Rewild Long Island. We were planting a pollinator garden here mm -hmm. together with North Shore Audubon. And uh, my children came here for camp. We offer camp in the summertime. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a wonderful place where we add to the curriculum that's taught in school. There is a nature-based uh, uh, theme in our education, as well as a really top-notch uh, STEM education. And um, our staff here, our educators, are really um, good at pointing out the interdependence, the, how uh, everything is connected in the web of life. And, and the reason why I have this fox here is because, you know, he belongs to the museum. We also have live animals here to cater to the children's love for life. Uh, and as an environmental educator, I've really been blessed with a great collaboration with education director Tracy Stryanis at the Sands Point Preserve and executive director Beth Horn uh, of the Sands Point Preserve Conservancy. It's really... Uh, one of the other places where I work in terms of education and outreach, and it's been a creative collaboration. I'm really grateful for that. So I'm on the board here at the Science Museum, but I work in the field at the Sands Point Preserve. Can you tell me about some of the virtual programs that you offer? Yes, we offer uh, a wide variety of workshops, and I would love to uh, encourage everyone to explore our website, smli.org, where we have um, the virtual programs, even offering uh, virtual field trips. And that's something that we created to meet the comfort levels of um, especially schools. We used to go visit them, but we're not able to do that. So there's a, both in physical sciences, life sciences, earth sciences, you'll find even outdoor programs virtually. We have a beach study, woodland ecology, uh, maple sugaring, uh, not for this season, but mm. water, uh, water everywhere. There's all different types of programs we offer. Here at the museum, we're, we're very proud to be part of a, a federal effort mm -hmm. um, to uh, restore the relationship from land uh, to bay or to the ocean. And uh, this is the Long Island Sound Futures Fund grant, where we received uh, considerable uh, funds to work with the stormwater runoff. Uh. And that in turn will uh, help with the health of our bay. And that will help our um, beach life, so to speak, that we are taking our students out to sea. And um, that's... Our goal with that is to create, not just have uh, educational programs for children, but also adults to teach um, our neighbors and community right relationship with the land. We also launched a community compost pilot here where we have, um, since September, we have already diverted about a thousand pounds of food waste from landfill mm. that's ready to become soil amendment. And we also, um, this summer, uh, we, we did not stop, but we um, partnered with Plant the Row uh, to feed the hungry mm. and over 3000 pounds were generated of food, vegetables that um, were donated to food pantries, fresh food. Uh, as there was considerable food insecurity as a result of the pandemic. So here at the Science Museum, we're interested in education, also outreach, and, and we really want to expand our activities to include families, so include all ages. Yeah, that's absolutely fantastic. We spoke about the, um, the fact that the museum is on park land. Could you just speak to that? Because... Um, there may be people that just would like to come by uh, to walk the property and uh, to see, you know, what's actually available there. Could you speak to the opportunity? Yes. It's a public park. Absolutely. It's a Nassau County Park and we have wonderful uh, walk uh, ways, paths through the woods. You can also sit at the pond if you're here at dusk, uh, and that's about the time when the park closes, mm -hmm. but it's, it's free admission and um, 
everyone is welcome to come and visit our grounds and get to know us and hopefully support us. Mm -hmm. There is a, a way to do that through our website. I'd like to mention that our educators here ha have really been terrific to meet the COVID restraints. Mm -hmm. We were able to carry out summer camp uh, without, so it was an infection-free summer camp. I, 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 I would like to say with scientific precision, we were able to have in-person contact with our students in small groups and kept them separated. And uh, we still offer in-person programs that are um, where we really make sure we meet all the protocols and so far have been blessed with no infection. That's fantastic. I uh, really am so impressed with the fact that it's not just education for children, it's really education for everybody so that we can make better choices in terms of um, how we live our lives every day. We'll be right back after this short break. You're watching Opportunity Calls with Ellen Volpe, presented by ABA, American Business Associates. To learn more about ABA, visit aba-ny.com. In 2017, you founded the Soul Center in Port Washington. Um, being uh, committed to inner and outer well-being, I'm wondering if you could tell us why you did it and what's available there to all of us in terms of being more mindful and having more mindful living. Yes, I, I believe um, mindfulness, um, it's, it's really... Um, our awareness that helps with education. So I, I teach mindfulness, I guess because I am a mindfulness meditation practitioner for a few decades now. I met mindfulness and meditation during my uh, graduate work in, at the Max Planck Institute of Biophysics in Germany. And, um, and there I started practicing and I believe the meditation practice together with my research work uh, were always uh, never, never uh, separate from one another. So uh, realizing why I do things is important to me. And I think um, anyone will benefit from pausing, uh, recognizing their thoughts, uh, realizing how thoughts lead to action. And uh, that gives a sense of well-being when we take a minute and, and just recognize this moment. We could even do that right now. If we just take a breath and we live in a quite fast-paced culture and very few people are taking the time to um, be here. We may be sheltering in place, but how many people are really there where they are? Mm. I would, I would dare to say that most people are uh, not with their mind embodied in this moment. We, I, I, at least many people I talk to are out of their mind, meaning they're either traveling <laughs> into the future with their thoughts or, or staying in the past. Uh, I've seen that in, in COVID. Uh, people wish things were not like this. And that's unproductive because things are like this right now. Mm -hmm. And it hurts. Part of my practice, I come, uh, I belong to a Tibetan Buddhist lineage mm -hmm. where we have been working for decades with uh, leaning into discomfort, welcoming the unwelcome. I'm quoting a book by Pema Chodron, one of the lineage holders, mm -hmm. is um, when we work with our mind, we start recognizing reality for what it is and not wishing away each moment. Mm -hmm. Uh, when uh, I see a, a lot of, uh, it's, it's fantasy really to want things to be different from what they are. Mm. But when we recognize the reality of our lived experience, that's empowering. And that's what I work with. And, I, and my groups, we've been resourceful here and uh, moved online like everyone else. Nice. And I really want to actually celebrate you for, for how you continue uh, in this new environment, we just must adapt. Right. That was Darwin's. That was Darwin's message to you know. In in terms of evolution, we natural selection, evolution. It has to do with adaptation. How do we adapt to changing times? Yeah. And my group, I, I've really enjoyed how the Soul Center Sangha. 
um, we are online and we have a group that keeps meeting and uh, grow is growing and and now we're not uh, any more confined in by the physical restraints of the uh, meditation studio. So we have uh, friends coming in to meditate from Italy and Iceland, mm. from the West Coast. And, and, uh, and it's really been a lovely experience and we've supported each other through this time. And uh, everyone is welcome to join us. It's uh, www.sol.center. It's our website where you can see our classes. And I teach both private and uh, group mindfulness meditation. And I find that I'm not quite sure how I would have dealt with this time uh, without it. Mm. Uh, I stepped up my own meditation program because when uh, a pandemic hits you, it's, it's not uh, comfortable. It's been extremely uncomfortable. <laughs> so all of our all of our teachings center around uh, impermanence and cause and effect, and uh, recognizing the ability to be comfortable even in uncomfortable mm -hmm. circumstances, keeping a stable mind uh, even if things are not the way I want it to be. So recognizing what's really going on and working with that productively. Yeah. Um, you know, the other uh, day when we were speaking, um, we were speaking about your children and um, there was a question of a snow day or not a snow day. And I was uh, taken back by the fact that um, you allowed your children um, a day to uh, just to be. Um, as opposed to not being. And I was just wondering if you could speak to that because I think um, we can leave a lot of families um, with um, some power um, if, they, if you would share that story. Well, I believe in um, wellness days. And I noticed my daughter was really at the end of her ability to cope. She was getting very frustrated and... and um, and I, these children have been going to school now for months with mask on, nine to three, uh, and behind their plexiglass. And we took a day off um, where we stayed together. And, and I took a day off too. And, and it was a, a wellness day. Instead of uh, stressing our uh, bodies and minds to the point of needing a sick day. And that's also something I practice uh, personally mm. is noting my, uh, really my uh, ability to be present and centered mm -hmm. and taking the time to do so. It generates a well-being that's within me. So it's not dependent on the external circumstances. Mm -hmm. And these are learned behaviors. I didn't always make these kind of choices. This is something I've learned with my meditation practice and it, it, it really um, feeds my purpose to teach meditation because I've witnessed firsthand how it helps. Mm -hmm. uh, 20 years ago, I, I, would, uh, I was not of such a stable mind <laughs> as I am today. <laughs> So they <laughs> I, I actually, if, if you'd ask anyone who knew me 20 years ago, I had the tendency to some Viking anger. Uh, uh, I, would, I would strike with, uh, I blame it on my ancestors, but I, I have come a long way. <laughs> well, I'm so happy that you came my way and I am so happy that you could join me today, Hilda. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Opportunity Calls with Ellen Volpe is sponsored by LongIsland.com. American Business Associates is New York Metro's premier business development and networking association. To learn more about ABA, visit aba-ny.com.